to their futures Soldiers speak out Soldiers speak out Soldiers speak out <laughs> Well, it's a real privilege to be here um, with you all. Um, it's a special privilege to be able to chat with people who pretty much know what the score is and try to go a little deeper mm. into what we're all about here. Um, Rachel Corey, of course, is the patron saint, in my view, of this area. And we're about to celebrate a sixth anniversary of something. Does anyone know what that is? Oh, yeah. That's correct. The death of Rachel Curry on March 17. March 16. We're experts around here. 2003, three days before what? Yeah. And so the Israelis who deliberately killed her knew full well that it would make any front pages in the Western press. The front pages would be dominated by the war, shock and awe, and so forth. An important realization of how cynical people can be uh, if they're out to show that not even foreign observers, not even foreign people, you can't hear it back there, okay. Um, oh, so I, so I need to project? Is that what I need to do because there's no mic here? Okay, all right, I'll project. Hey, if you hold the mic up to your mouth. Which way? Just project on the TV. Okay, I'll talk a little louder. Uh, please raise your hand back there if you can't hear me. <laughs> Thanks, Elliot. Thanks a lot. Okay, all right, let's get serious here. I had an old uh, Russian teacher who used to say when we were unruly, she said, this is nothing to laugh. <laughs> who are you laughing? What are you laughing? This is nothing to laugh. <laughs> she thought laugh was sort of a transitive verb in English. And so, of course, that got us laughing really hard when she said that. You know. Well, let's... Uh, Let's do a one-minute Quaker prayer, uh, remembering what happened on the 16th of March, 2003, and what happened on the 19th of March, We're going to keep on moving forward. 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 Never turning back. Never turning back. And this is a tough one. We're going to keep on loving our enemies. 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 Never turning back. Never turning back. I think that may come from Fanny Lou Hamer, about whom many of you know and who famously said that if she fell in the battle for freedom, she was going to fall forward 
and that way no one else would ha will have to travel the five foot one inches that represent her body in the, in, the, in the fight for freedom. She's one of my heroes, and I think there's a lot to be gained from studying that kind of, oh, thank you, wow. Um, from studying and, and remembering people like that. Uh, before I begin the main part of my remarks, I'd like to do what I always do these days, and that is uh, just refer you all uh, to three transcendent realities that I think are, are worth mentioning and just sort of keeping in the back of our minds as we discuss anything important these days. The first one is global warming. <clears throat> I mean, the fact that it's so daunting should not erase it from the back of our minds, all right? Okay. The second one is that the world is running out of oil and gas and water. The war in Iraq can be legitimately regarded as the first resource war of the 21st century. Unless we get our act together, it will be only the first. And third, and this is what I describe as the biggest sea change that I've witnessed in the 45 years that I've been in Washington. And that is that we no longer have, in any real sense, a free media. And that is big, folks. That is really big. Now, we do have the internet. We do have the web. That's the good news. But I can't help thinking that we really haven't figured imaginative ways to exploit that technology to its fullest. I look forward to folks younger than I that can figure that out. Now, with respect to uh, uh, what we're going to be discussing here, let me uh, read. In the Bronx, we, we used to say, Daddy, read me out of the paper, or Daddy, read me out of the book. So I'm going to read you out of the book for a paragraph or two. And this is a special book. It's called Defying Hitler, Sebastian Hafner. Is anybody, anybody familiar with it? It's the diary of a young lawyer in Berlin in the early 30s who kept a day-to-day -day account of what was going on. He never intended to publish it, but his, his uh, children found it and published it as a book. It became a bestseller in Germany and elsewhere. It's not very much uh, appreciated around here. Uh, so he's in Germany in the 1930s. This is 1933. And he says, I, I really can't blame, no one can really blame the Germans uh, for being so traumatized by the Reichstagsplan, the, the, bur the burning of the Reichstag, the German parliament. What one can blame them for, and what shows their terrible collective weakness of character, says Hafner, is that this settled the matter with sheepish, sheepish submissiveness, okay, I'll say that again, with sheepish uh, submissiveness, the German people accepted that as a result of the fire, each one of them lost what little personal freedom had been guaranteed them by their constitution, as though uh, it followed as a necessary consequence. If the communists burned down the Reichstag, or we might say, if the terrorists burned down the Twin Towers, it was perfectly in order that the government would take extra extraordinary, or as the German word says, decisive measures. And we might add to include the supreme international crime defined by Nuremberg, war of aggression. That's important, folks, because Nuremberg grappled with this, and they defined uh, war of aggression as the supreme international crime, uh, differing from other war crimes only, only in as much as it contains the accumulated evil of the whole. Okay? Now, what would that accumulated evil be? What would be an example? Anyone? Torture. Torture. All right. What else? Civilian slaughter. Civilian slaughter. Kidnapping, yeah, somebody's kidnapping. Illegal, illegal, illegal weapons, yeah, putting people in black holes and not telling their wives or their children or, or the Red Cross, yeah. 
accumulated evil of the whole people. We'll be talking a little bit about that. But I want to continue with Hafner here and just, uh, just read another paragraph or two, if I may. He described the sequence of events in Germany as wholly within the normal range of psychology, and it helps to explain the almost inexplicable. The only thing that is missing is what in animals is called breeding. This is a solid inner kernel that cannot be shaken by external pressures and forces. Something noble and steely, a reserve of pride, principle, and dignity to be drawn on in the hour of trial. And he says, Hafner does, it is missing in Germans. As a nation, they have no backbone. And this was shown in March 1933 at the moment of truth when other nations rise spontaneously to the occasion and the Germans collectively and limply collapsed and yielded to a nervous breakdown. Germany became a nightmare for the rest of the world. And finally, today we Germans are yoked to a daily timetable, cogs in a mechanism we don't control, running steadily on rails and helpless if we become derailed. Only the daily routine provides security and continuity. Every European of the 20th century feels this in his bones. It is the cause of his reluctance to do anything that might derail his life. In this way, unsure of myself, temporizing, I performed my routine daily duties. But at home, I gave way to fruitless and ridiculous outbursts at the dinner table. Sound familiar? <laughs> Excluded from events and passive like millions of others, I let events come at me. And they <laughs> I'm thinking of what Hafner says here about the Germans. The question remains why no individuals ever spontaneously oppose some particular injustice or iniquity that they experienced. Well, in this country over the last eight years, you can say some, but not all. Not veterans of peace. When Cindy Sheehan rose to the occasion to fight that iniquity, to, to brace the president with the question, Mr. President, you say my son's death was worth it? You say that my son's death was for a noble cause? Well, I'm going to go... I'm going to go visit you at Crawford and ask you what that noble cause was because, because I don't believe it. And what did Veterans of Peace do? Yeah. yeah. That's why I'm so, so very proud to be part of, of this movement and honored to be able to speak to you today. When this crowd came in, that is eight years ago, we were exposed to the need to have faith-based this and faith-based that, but we intelligence professionals never thought that we would be asked to do faith-based intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what faith-based intelligence is worth. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's all right with you, I'm going to draw on my Irish heritage. Yeah. <laughs> so there's these two nuns going home. Uh, from the hospital where they worked to the convent on a winter evening about four o'clock. It's getting dark already, and don't they run out of petrol. <laughs> Half a mile from the petrol station, they opened up the bonnet and the hood, and they looked underneath there, and there was no gas can, but there was a bedpan from the hospital. <laughs> so they said, well, this is better than nothing, so they went down to the petrol station, and I don't know if you... Those of you who worked in the hospital can tell us all how unwieldy a bedpan is. <laughs> so they go back to the car, and one, one, uh, one nun is unscrewing the gas cap there, and the other nun is struggling with <laughs> screeches to a halt. A great big limousine. One of those fancy ones where you push a button and, and the window goes down by itself. <laughs> 
<laughs> and who's looking from the front but the Reverend Ian Paisley. <laughs> now, he sizes up the situation with the nuns struggling with the bedpan. He says, sisters, I don't agree with your religion, but I do admire your faith. <laughs> up the teaching point here, okay? Faith-based intelligence is worth what Ian Paisley thought was in that bed pit. <laughs> now, jokes aside, most of you know that it was worse than that. It was deliberate. We know that now because we have, and this has been given very little attention, because of the, what I call, the fawning corporate press, we have the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence pronouncing what happened. I think I'm going to read you just a little bit here from, from that, because it's so relevant. By a vote of 10 to 5, with two Republicans, Chuck Hagel and Olympia Snow, con concurring, uh, the Senate Select Committee, after five years, <laughs> five years of investigation concluded that the public statements of the Bush administration on weapons of mass destruction were not supported by the intelligence. So those of you who watch the president say, oh, you know, I'm really disappointed. And the intelligence was so, you know, the intelligence was so, I'm really disappointed. Well, tell all your friends, he knew full well that the intelligence was bogus. Among other things, suppressed by the mainstream press, yes. is the fact that my colleagues, my former colleagues on the operational side of CIA, had recruited the Iraqi foreign minister, Naji Sabri. How many of you knew that? Very few. Well, okay. Right. This is more than usual, okay? We got him working in place. We, you know, the technical term, we turned him, okay? Saddam Hussein thought he was working for Saddam Hussein. He was reporting to us. And what did he tell us? A whole bunch of things. They all checked out. He also told us there aren't any weapons of mass destruction. And the president was told that on September 18, 2002. And if that's not enough, the British helped us recruit the head of Iraqi intelligence. His name is Habush. The end of January 2003, he told us the same thing. So please, please, when your friends say, you know, isn't it too bad that the poor president was deceived by, by, uh, and, and disappointed with the intelligence? Please tell him that. Rockefeller, the senator, who normally doesn't go out uh, during the daytime, he's afraid of his own shadow. And he was head of the Overlook, I'm sorry, supposed to be the Oversight Committee, you know? They've been renamed the Overlook Committee. <laughs> I kid you not, when, uh, when Vice President Cheney briefed Jay Rockefeller and others uh, about the illegal wiretapping, anybody remember what Jay Rockefeller bragged about doing? Well, he wasn't going to take this sitting down. He went back to his desk, and since it was so sensitive, he couldn't have any secretary uh, type it out. But he wrote a letter. He wrote a letter to Dick Cheney saying, I don't know about this, I have some concerns about this, signed to Jay Rockefeller, kept a copy in his safe, and sent that courageous letter to the Vice President. He never got an answer, but it came up again when Dick Cheney was doing one of his exit interviews, and he says, you know, <clears throat> I just got a call from Jay Rockefeller. Senator Rockefeller asked me if I could give him a copy of that letter he sent because he misplaced his copy. <laughs> well, anyhow, uh, Rockefeller stepped out of character for once. And this is what he said about the Senate report on whether the, whether the administration distorted the intelligence. I quote. Actually, I'll start the quote from the beginning. Quote. In making the case for war, the administration repeatedly presented intelligence as fact, when in reality, it was unsubstantiated, contradicted, 
or even non-existent. <laughs> Hello? Non-existent intelligence? Who would that be? <laughs> oh, maybe forgery? Maybe forgery? Who did the forgery? You know what? The FBI was never allowed to investigate that. But I'll bet you. I'll bet you that the trail leads right under, right under the vice president's door. I'm not saying that he and, and Lynn Cheney sat down one night and forged these, uh, these documents about yellow cake in the Niger, but I think they had something to do with it. Okay, now, uh, I would like to ask uh, someone to turn the lights down if they can a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to warn you because this little um, this little clip that I'm going to show is only two minutes. So if you had a lot of breakfast and you're going to doze off, you're going to miss the whole thing. <laughs> and this is on the final. <laughs> so please look at the bottom and make sure you remember what date these statements were made. If you really want to know the truth about the state of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction before the invasion, listen to Colin Powell in February 2001. He states clearly that there was no threat from Saddam Hussein. He has not developed any significant capability with respect to weapons of mass destruction. He is unable to project conventional power against his neighbors. And this is Condoleezza Rice, Bush's national security advisor, in July of the same year, saying the same thing, putting the lie to their own propaganda. Uh, we are able to keep arms from him. His military forces have not been rebuilt. And that, many believe, was the truth, a truth that was covered up and conveniently forgotten after September the 11th, when Bush and Blair decided to attack Iraq. They found no weapons of mass destruction, no links with Al-Qaeda, no nuclear weapons, no 45-minute threat. So was it all a charade? Uh, it was 95% charade. charade. <laughs> a charade indeed. The invasion had been planned long ago. In July last year, Condoleezza Rice told another Bush official, that decision has been made. Don't waste your breath. This is not what Bush told the American people. It's this that makes the inquiry in London by Lord Hutton look like a dramatic... We could have the lights, that would be great. Wake up. <laughs> okay, what was the date of Colin Powell's talk? February 2001. All right, and Condoleezza Rice. Actually, the date was July 29th, so about... What, about six weeks before yeah. 11. Now, uh, so uh, the Iraqis had no weapons of mass destruction before 9-11 and weren't a threat even to their immediate neighbors. And we were being asked to believe that after 9-11 when Cheney and Rumsfeld talked about all these terrible weapons that uh, the weapons of mass destruction uh, descended like manna from the heavens <laughs> for a soft landing on the sands of Iraq where God made that terrible <coughs> mistake of putting our oil. Yeah. Give me a break. Yeah. You don't get weapons of mass destruction in six weeks <laughs> or two months, usually for two years or six years. So, you know, it was a no-brainer. That's what was going on. Now, have any of you seen that footage? No. Yes. Yeah. Okay, it's in a documentary by John Pilger, who is the oh, uh, voice there, okay? And uh, I, I must confess that as hard, as closely as I used to watch the high-level statements on this subject, I had missed those two. I, I, I didn't remember that Colin Powell and Condoleezza had said those things. And so I, I immediately, he sent me a, an advanced copy, and I said, John, how'd you, where'd you get those, those clips? Mm -hmm. And he said, Ray, uh, I'm a professional journalist, and uh, and so I uh, I ordered all the tapes of uh, Condoleezza and uh, Powell on this subject, and took about twenty of them into this uh, booth. My friends feared for my sanity, <laughs> but I went in and I spent two days, and I found them. And I said to myself, "Wow, 
Journalism. Wow. <laughs> you know? Amazing. Did no American journalist even look? No. I mean, they don't have to go into the booth. All I have to do is LexisNexis or even Google. <laughs> and they find it? Well, I suspect they did. And I expect their editors said, please, please, you know, we're going to have this war, uh, you know, we're going to like, well, be a patriot. So that's how bad it is, folks. That's how bad it is. Now, the, uh, let me ask uh, how much time we have, because I want to leave a goodly amount of time for questions. When do we, when do I have to... Uh, when do you get ready? <laughs> well, okay, just supply the hook. And it, and Ray, yes? We have to be out of here at 11.30, so, and the VFP national people want to speak for maybe 15 minutes, okay. so... So I should, how about I should wind up at about 15 minutes. 11 o'clock, no. You, you okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll open the questions uh, in about 15 minutes, so that's okay. Is that right? Good. I could stop now if you... No! <laughs> Don't have any more jokes. <laughs> okay. Well, in order to wage this war, the president, uh, Rove, told him he really should go to Congress like your daddy did, you know, before he spoke to him. Yeah. It's good to have Congress aboard. And Congress, of course, didn't have any real intelligence about war weapons of mass destruction. So, what happened? Yes. The head of the Senate Select Committee... Uh, called up George Tenet in mid-September, mind you, 2002, and said, where's the estimate on weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? And he said, oh, you know, we've been real busy. Uh, we don't have an estimate like that. And uh, Graham said, well, you're asking us to vote for war on the basis of this, and you don't have enough? Well, you better do one. He said, well, we're really busy, you know. <laughs> So Bob Graham goes back to Dick Durbin and he says, Tennant says he's too busy. And Durbin flies off the hand and says, you tell him, no estimate, no vote on the war, okay? And so George Tennant goes down to the White House and says, and we can't avoid an estimate anymore. I guess we're going to have to have to do one. And the president, or president probably Andy Card, somebody like that, says, okay, well, let me, I'll be right back to you. He goes back, he says, well, all right, do an estimate. Are just two conditions. It's got to come out like Dick Cheney said it was uh, in his major speech, August 26th, there in Nashville. Those, no, in other words, uh, all kinds of uh, weapons of mass destruction, renewed work on nuclear weapons, and UN inspectors aren't worth a damn. The whole whole nine yards is what he said then. And number two, it's got to be done in two weeks. <laughs> now, usually these things take you know at least two months. Why two weeks? Anybody figure that one out? <laughs> Midterm elections. There you go. Yeah, there, were, there were elections coming up in November. And, you know, all those Democrats that made that terrible, terrible choice of voting against the glorious war where almost nobody got killed, but 250,000 veterans got poisoned. All right? Another thing that the, the fawning corporate press avoids. Okay, well, those. Those Democrats suffered at the polls the next uh, next midterm election. So Karl Rove was hell bent and determined that this estimate would be done a month before the election. And indeed, the malleable managers that had bubbled to the top in my old agency saluted and served up the very worst national intelligence estimate in the history of our country. Wrong in every count. Now there have been other bad ones. When I first came on board under President Kennedy, we gave him an estimate in September of 2000, I'm sorry, 1962, which said the, the Russians would never, ever try to put missiles in Cuba because they know exactly what we'd do. You know, they think, well, we were wrong. But my friends, that was an honest mistake. It was dumb. It was mirror imaging. You know, we try not to do that again, but it was an honest mistake. This estimate, which I call the, which I call the whore of Lebanon, uh, the whore of Babylon, uh, was dishonest from the get-go. Now, I used to chair these uh, national intelligence estimates, and so I can put a picture being there, you know, uh, where representatives, very senior people from the 16 now, 16, would you believe it, intelligence agencies in Washington, 
And what happens, you know, you say, okay, the question is, uh, how soon could Iraq get a nuclear weapon? All right, DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, what, what do you say? Three years. Okay, NSA, two years. All right, uh, CIA, two and a half years. Uh, State Department? Uh, State Department? <laughs> The uh, State Department representative, to his credit, said, well, he said it very diplomatically. He said, sir, you're, uh, you're putting us in a very difficult position because you're asking us to predict the end of a program that we don't believe has started yet. <laughs> <laughs> Which reminds me of my favorite cartoon. <laughs> My daughter, our middle daughter, uh, studied history at the University of Virginia. And when she was a sophomore, she sent me this BC cartoon, you know, the fellow with the one clock on. Okay, so it's, uh, it's a father standing on a big, big rock. And his uh, daughter is cringing below. And he's got this big stone tablet, which is clearly a report card, okay? <laughs> and the caption says, oh, great, history F. You flunked something that didn't even happen yet. <laughs> People, most people say, you think that's funny? <laughs> well, what's the point? The point is that the State Department was being asked to predict the end of a program. No, hey, you started it. You... <laughs> and to their credit, they're holding fast. Because if you read the testimony before the Senate of the new Director of National Intelligence, he's talking about how soon Iran could get a nuclear weapon. How soon do you think, you guys? Uh, three months. Well, they say between one and five years, probably two or five years. Yeah. And what were they saying five years ago? Five years. Probably two to five years. What did they say ten years ago? Maybe five years. I've been mean, saying that for twenty years. You'd think they'd be a little embarrassed. <laughs> but the State Department, I guess it'd be an embarrassment. But the State Department, to its credit, and that's the point I'm trying to make, took another footnote and said, look, they're going to have so many technical difficulties, it's not going to be, you know, if it's five years, it's going to be toward the end of the five years. So there's still a lot of honest people around, and there were a whole bunch of honest people that forced through the estimate on Iran last time, November of 07, which said they had stopped. <laughs> Hear that? They had stopped work on the weapons-related part of their nuclear program. When? 03. In the fall of 03. And was there any evidence that they were restarting it? No. no. Okay. Is there any evidence now that they restarted it? No. no. Well, how do we know? Yeah. What we're trying to do is get somebody to order up an update of that estimate. That's what we used to do. We used to call it a memorandum to holders. So you do a memorandum to holders of the earlier estimate. You don't have to go through the whole nine yards anymore. You pick up from where they left off. You say, there's been a change or there's not been a change. Mm -hmm. You know what? There hasn't been a change. But they don't want to say that because Iran is very much, uh, you know, being portrayed as a threat again. And I, I'm dearly afraid that with Netanyahu taking over in Israel, that he will try to mousetrap our young president, as Khrushchev tried to do with uh, President Kennedy. I've been there. I've seen that. Okay. Um, now, you may detect a little anger. Uh, yeah, where I grew up in the Bronx, uh, anger was sort of frowned upon, you know. I mean, it was sort of a volatile place there in the Bronx, and uh, you could be angry for a day or maybe two. If you're Irish, they'd give you a week. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, you weren't supposed to be angry all the time. And I found myself just really bursting with anger uh, from the very beginning of 2003. Because, like, you know, as we all could see, the war was going to come. And um, luckily, I remember something I learned in college. And for those younger folks, or, you know, it, it's good to, to know that every now and then something sticks, you know? <laughs> I went to Fordham University, a Jesuit college in, in New York, in the Bronx. I walked to school. Uh, and they were big on St. Thomas Aquinas, real big on him. Matter of fact, uh, we had to read so much of Thomas Aquinas that students at other Catholic <laughs> colleges used to go around calling us Keeping Thomists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, anyhow, the point is, I remembered something from Thomas Aquinas that really helped. Because Aquinas had some weird ideas about women and about other things that he didn't know anything about. But he did have some good ideas on virtue and, and philosophical principles that he explored and uh, articulated. And one was, uh, he, he complained bitterly uh, that the word for the virtue of anger, hear that guys? The virtue of anger, manas in nominata, remains unnamed. There was no word in Latin for the virtue of anger. He got angry. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. That upset him because he wanted to write about this virtue of anger. See, he bought the old Pythagorean idea where virtue is in the middle, right? Okay. So too much of anything is no good, too little is also no good. Uh, take courage, for example. Courage is just enough of what you need. Foolhardiness, no good. Uh, timidity, no good. Well, um, Thomas complained that there's no way to approach this, to describe the virtue of anger, and yet it was a reality, and he had to go back to the fourth century church and quote John Chrysostom, who said, he or she who is not angry when there is just cause for anger sins. Oh. Put that on a banner, you guys. John Chrysostom, fourth century. Um, now, Thomas, always being up to improving on things, uh, added his little corollary, and he said, well, what he did was he railed against what he called unreasoned patience. It's the best translation we can do. Can you imagine? Okay, unreasoned patience. So I talked about the Germans, okay? And he defined, he said, unreasoned patience sows the seeds of vice, nourishes negligence, and encourages not only bad people, but good people to do evil. That made me feel a lot better. <laughs> so if, if I look virtuous this morning, it's because I'm so damn angry still. <laughs> um, I think Cindy Sheehan is, for me, the epitome of the virtue of anger. I'm just so proud of this movement, this organization, and the support it gave Cindy. You know, Cindy was not one to avoid being angry and... Uh, as most of you know, she would not hesitate uh, to call appropriate people lying bastards. <laughs> um, and uh, she makes fun of me because when we were going to do official testimony before the Conyers Committee, I had the poor, poor judgment to write her a little email and say, now Cindy, <laughs> probably be best if we didn't do the lying bastards bit this time. <laughs> Hey, come on. <laughs> of course, she wasn't going to, and it was totally un unnecessary. <laughs> one of the super things I've done. Um, how, how, can we, how can we abide? How can we abide 4,260 of our young men and women being killed? How can we abide, you know, how many Iraqi civilians are dead now? would be alive if it weren't for the war. Now, some of the good estimates say a million. And others say, no, 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 it's just a hundred thousand. Just. Just. What's wrong with that statement? Just yeah. a hundred thousand. <laughs> yeah. Give me a break, you know? And how many internal refugees? Four and a half million. How many external refugees? Yeah. Out of a country of, what, 26 million before the war? Wow. How do we stand for that? Um, I have learned in my life to listen to my children, sort of belatedly, <laughs> but now I listen to my grandchildren real carefully, and uh, we have seven and a half grandchildren, <laughs> and uh, one due next week. Um, but little Claire, who was four years old at the time, uh, and in Oakland, California, uh, daughter of my daughter Kathleen, um, my wife knew that I was going to be on McNeil, or not McNeil, but the Valera Report, and so she called Kathleen and said, Dad's going to be on me, you might want to watch it. So she and Claire sat before the TV and watched me on Lara. And when it was all over, Claire went to my daughter Kathleen, and she said, Mommy, Mommy, that was Grandpa. Mm. And Kathleen said, yeah. She said, well, Mommy, that means the other people are real, too. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. Now that's cute, right? But but think about what that means, people. Uh huh. If you don't know somebody in the picture, the other people aren't real too. We used to at least have pictures of Vietnam. It's so easy to diss people if you never see them. And it's easier still if they don't look like you. If their skin is a little darker or a lot darker. And you can call them gooks or you can call them cow heads, sand niggers, which is what our troops are trained to call these folks. You know, racism, I hate to say, plays a big, big role in all this. Sure. We heard uh, James Yi. What did they call him? Anybody remember? Chinese the Chinese, the Chinese Taliban. Taliban. Yeah. Aaron Watata. General Taguba. And Taguba did the only honest report on Abu Ghraib. And what happens to him? He summoned into the limousine General Abizaid in Kuwait. And what does Abizaid say? We're investigating your report, General Taguba, and we're also investigating you. Taguba told Sai Hirsch that after 32 years as an army officer, he realized he was no longer working for the U.S. Army, he was working for the Mafia. To move his words. Take Mukasey, our dearly deported Attorney General, or take Mike McConnell, our recently deported Director of National Intelligence. Both of them, both of them said, well, waterboarding, uh, well, it, uh, it was nasty. It, it would be torture if it were applied to me. Hmm. <laughs> well, those other people, I suppose, yeah. they didn't say, but not to those other people, but what? So this is really, really important, folks. I think we have to focus on that because it's very sinister and it underlies a lot of this stuff. Uh, the Germans... Uh, by and large, didn't measure up. Uh, the Cindy Sheehan's were not supported by the German people. There was no Veterans for Peace there in Germany. There were a couple of people who, who tried their best, though. Uh, Beatrix, uh, the Scholl sisters, certainly. The White Rose, the Weisse Rose, yeah. And uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the uh, uh, Lutheran pastor. Uh, he was, of course, hanged. There was another fellow. Have any of you heard of uh, Albrecht Haushofer? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I'm going to tell you about Albrecht Haushofer. He was a geologue, uh, a, a geologist at the University of Berlin, and he got his doctorate by keeping his mouth shut. But when the war started and he saw his uh, Jewish friends being rounded up and he saw the, the chaos there in Europe, uh, he had uh, uh, pangs of conscience, okay? And he started speaking out against it and started accumulating a little bit of a following. And so the SS wrapped them up, threw them in, an, in another Berlin jail. And you know, they're very meticulous, the Germans. Uh, they won't shoot you or hang you, which were the two execution methods preferred, uh, without your signing a confession. Okay. Haushofer wouldn't sign the confession. And they got so ticked off toward the end of the war when they see it was ending uh, that they shot him anyway. As they picked him up off the floor, out comes this little zettel, little piece of paper from his pocket. It was his confession. It was written in the form of a sonnet. It's very brief. I'd like to read it to you and translate it. Okay? Schuld. Anybody have German? Guilty. Guilty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. guilt. Okay. Doch. Bin ich schuldig, aber anders als sie denkt. Ja, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty, but it's not what you think. Ich musste früher, früher, earlier, ich musste früher meine Pflicht erkennen. I should have earlier recognized my duty. Ich oh. musste schärfer, unheil, unheil nennen. I should have schärfer, more sharply, called evil, evil, 
mein Urteil habe ich zu lang gelenkt. I put off my judgment for too long. Ich habe gewarnt, I did warn, and he, and he did, aber nicht genug. Enough. Und klar. Klar, klar, oh, klar. I did warn, but not enough. Und klar. Und heute was, weiß ich, was ich schuldig war. Mm -hmm. And today I recognize what I was guilty of. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to wrap this up uh, and just say that uh, I'm delighted that to be with a group that has spoken out, that didn't keep silent, and uh, that didn't get discouraged uh, by uh, all those years where it seemed to be not successful. See, this concept, this American concept of success is really pernicious. You know? uh, we shouldn't be doing things that we always do, uh, without, you know, what we try to do is piece together, will I be sex successful at this? And if there's a reasonable chance, we'll do it. Well, the kind of activity that we're engaged in, uh, protesting, lies, murder, and the so, and so forth, uh, that has its own justification. Uh, we're not supposed to be successful, we're supposed to be faithful. We're supposed to do what's right. And I'm thinking of that, that gentleman, perhaps you've heard this real story, uh, he, he goes out before uh, prisons when people are being executed, and he has this big sign against capital punishment. And at one point, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the newspaper people came up and said, you know, this is pretty feckless. Here it is, pouring rain. You're saying nobody's looking at you. you what, kind of, what kind of result do you, do you expect to get from holding this against capital punishment sign? He says, well, you know, he says, I'm... I'm not trying to, uh, expecting that to uh, change the system. I just don't want the system to change me. Yeah. I think that's what this is about. Wendell Berry, one of my favorite authors, says that protest that endures is moved by a hope far more modest than that of public success. Namely, the hope of preserving qualities in one's own heart and spirit that would be destroyed by acquiescence. One of my favorite uh, parts of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. Remember the, the good bishop, Bishop Bienvenu, who, who tells the police that he gave those candlesticks to uh, Jean Valjean? Um, uh, Hugo uh, permits himself some editorial observations here and points out that this bishop is never going to go anywhere. You know, he's, he just, he's, he's concerned about his people. You know, he's not concerned about moving up to be archbishop. And as a result, he can't even get priests to work in his diocese because, you know, they will be hindered in their career advancement. Then he, Hugo says, well, you know, success is an ugly word. It's a very ugly word because all too often people confuse it with merit. Mm. Uh, I love that. Nobody else seems to love it as much as I, but I think it speaks volumes. And I'd like to close here with a, uh, with a recognition that there's a lot of pain involved in all this stuff and that somehow uh, we need to recognize that uh, even as we try to keep a, a, a positive and, if possible, a joyful outlook on, on what we're doing. This is Rainer Marie Rilke, and, and talking about suffering and the heaviness. The poet says, give the heaviness back to the weight of the earth. The mountains are heavy, heavy the oceans. Even the trees you planted as children long since grew too heavy. You could not sustain them, ah, but the breezes. And with another word, the breezes, the spirit, ruha, spiritus. Well, may the spirit that sustains people like Rachel Corey and Cindy Sheehan and lifts their heaviness, lift ours as well, and empower us all to keep working for justice and peace. Si sí, se puede. Si sí, se puede. And
to their future.